I do appreciate the kind comments that Paul made regarding these lessons. I said long, many years ago, that one of the problems that I saw in regards to translations and just the proliferation of them was the fact that nobody was, it was going to be that nobody knew what the Bible said. Uh, you can go into a Bible class and somebody reads a passage and invariably, well, that's not what my Bible says. And they read what their Bible says and somebody, well, mine says such and, and mine says, and you start going through all of these translations because, and you end up, well, what does the Bible actually say? Who knows? So it is a problem that we see in the church. And the type of policy of which the elders of this congregation long ago, when they first said King James and American Standard, and then later added the New King James, uh, having a policy like that eliminates a lot of those types of, of problems. You can have confidence and <clears throat> in relationship to what God's Word says. Having said that, let me add this. I am not against a new translation. I am against writing error into a Bible and calling it God's Word. That's where the problem resides. If they will stick with translating God's Word into English, then fine. Um, Paul mentioned the aspect of, you know, the Corne Greek. What? Well, the nice thing about Corne Greek, you can study it from the standpoint that it is a dead language. The words don't change meaning. We live today using the English language and words change meaning. Um, if you don't believe that, let me ask if you mind being called gay. Now, in the 1940s and 1950s, you wouldn't mind that. Today, that's a different matter, isn't it? Because what's happened, the word has changed meaning over time and really has been abused by the homosexual community over time. Thus, there is many times need for new translations and we're not opposed to that um, we are not supportive I do not support those who argue for the King James only position um, now if you're not familiar with those some of them depending on the type of King James only that you get uh, they have made the statement that the King James translators corrected the Greek. Well, we are opposed to that sort of nonsense. It, they say it is an inspired translation. Uh, thus, it could not be wrong. Uh, well, we oppose things like that. We do support new translations, but they need to be true to God's Word. And we've mentioned previously that we can rely on our Bibles. Uh, even though there are many that are not accurately translated, uh, we can give and have an understanding of Here's what God said. And even in relationship to the translations. So I mentioned this morning, and I think last uh, week, that we were going to begin looking at the English Standard Version. 
This is, in one sense, the new darling version. It has become very popular today. Uh, I tried to find statistics as to the n number of Bibles that are sold. Uh, one time I found that uh, the English Standard Version is the one that outsells any of the others. Uh, another time I saw that the New International NIV was the most popular selling Bible. Invariably, the King James Version was placed in second position on both of those lists. So whether or not it is the best-selling version today, it is very popular. It is being used by mem many members of the church today. Um, and there are some, I'll just mention Facebook groups, that vehemently defend the ESV version. When you're dealing with the ESV, it has that it is, quote, our, well, both English Standard Version and ESV, quote, are registered trademarks of Good News Publishers. Use of either trademark re requires the permission of Good News Publishers when quotations from the ESV text are used in non-saleable -sale media, such as church bulletins, orders of service, posters, transparencies, or similar media, a complete copyright notice is not required. But the initials ESV must appear at the end of the quotation. I don't know if it bothers anyone else, but it does bother me to say we're going to copyright God's Word. And if you use it, you're going to have to give a copyright quote. Now, then, just for legality's sake, we have done that. <laughs> We've done, we have met their criteria in setting forth that this is the, from the ESV or the English Standard Version. Um, so that's up front, though. That is what they state. Uh, why would we want to copyright the Bible? That's a good question that I think needs to be considered at least in relationship to these translations. Now then, let me add, the ESV is not the only translation that has been copyrighted through the years. Many of them have been. And many of them require a statement, either a full uh, copyright notice or the initials like this, ESV, being used in relationship to those translations, they require that anytime you use them. Um, so uh, understand, this is not the only one that does that. Others do it as well, but it should be a raise a question mark as to why are they doing this? Uh, I know that some have stated very vehemently that the reason that you do things like this and trademark it and copyright it is purely for money-making pro uh, process. Now, whether that's true or not, that's another subject, but it is at least copyrighted material. The ESV claims to be, uh, well, before I get to this point, I'll go back. The ESV claims to be an essential, essentially literal translation that seeks, actually that uh, should be this one, the 
Let me just go back because I had skipped a section that I wanted to get to. This is claims that are made in the preface. If you remember several weeks ago, I said you can learn a lot about a translation by reading the preface. So we want to look at the preface of this. One of them is that they state that the words and phrases themselves grow out of the Tyndale King James legacy and most recently out of the RSV with the 1971 RSV text providing the starting point for our work. I remember when the RSV came out as the entire Bible. It was promoted and it was known as a Bible for the liberal Protestant denominations. That's the way it was known. They, they boldly proclaimed such. Now then, the ESV comes along, and in their preface here, they're saying that's the starting point. So, now then, I will say, for example, in Isaiah 7.14, the Revised Standard Version used the word young woman instead of virgin. Behold, a child shall be, or a virgin shall be with child, they had translated young woman. The ESV changed it back to virgin. Correctly so. There's a couple of other illustrations that could be used in relationship to that. But to take that which was publicized by themselves as a liberal Protestant denominational Bible and say, that's our starting point. What should we expect then of this translation if it's not going to be a, literal, a liberal Protestant denominational translation? Uh, Randy Key, in, uh, in a review of the ESV, made the statement, uh, basically, if you compare the RSV and the ESV, there is, and he used the phrase, great similarity. And then he went on to say, and in most places, there is no difference at all. So they basically just took the RSV and made it into theirs, and with a few alterations and changes being made. A second, uh, well, a second claim in their preface is that the ESV is an essentially literal translation that seeks, <coughs> seeks as far as possible to reproduce the precise wording of the original text and the personal style of each Bible writer. As such, its, its emphasis is on word-for-word -word correspondence, or uh, correspondence, at the same time taking full account of differences in grammar, syntax, and idiom between the current literary English and the original languages. That is a marvelous statement. If that were true, there would be absolutely no problems that anyone should have with this translation. Now, there was a big word that started that sentence, and that is the word if. This is, though, this statement is what every translation should do. It is seeking to, as far as possible, rep reproduce the precise language or wording of the original text into our language. 
And yes, that has to be considering the differences in grammar and syntax. And sometimes, yes, the idioms that could be used. The, one of the main, if not the main, editors of the ESV has written some marvelous works in relationship to this controversy of, I talked about the philosophy of translation. He has written some marvelous works showing that a word for word or dynamic or the uh, literal equivalent or formal equivalent is the proper way to translate. So they at least claim a something, something that is a marvelous claim. And I'll just say that I wish that they had stuck with what they claimed. Because, let's notice this, still in the preface. In the area of gender language, the goal of the ESV is to render literally what is in the original. For example, any one replaces any man. Where there is no word corresponding to man in the original languages, and people rather than man, men is regularly used, where the original language refers to both men and women. Gender inclusive language is what they're seeking. Now, I tell you that in the, in the preface. Probably when they did their translations, translation, they did not realize the stupidity that we're seeing in our society in America today in regards to gender. Now, I will, I will grant them that. But why should we give up something in order to produce something that is going to be gender inclusive? And that's really what they are doing. Um, they want to get away from the idea of man. For example, the Greek word anthropos is a Greek word that is inclusive of both men and women. It is generally translated men, or in the plural, man in the singular. As opposed to, for example, gune, which is woman, or aner, which is man. And you have the specific uh, sexual identity being set forth. Anthropos is a general term. Uh, a quick uh, illustration, 1 Timothy 2 and verse 1, where Paul is saying to pray for all men. He uses that Greek word, anthropos. Why should we just do away with that, which uh, it is uh, to give in to those feminist that have arisen within our nation that is trying to eliminate the idea of man. Um, in fact, uh, listening to one not too long ago that did not even want to be called, uh, did not even want woman to be used because it included the word man in it. But let me give an illustration and you'll see something in relationship to this of gender language. In Genesis 3 and verse 16, the ESV says, To the woman, he said, I will surely multiply your pain in childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be contrary to your husband, and he shall rule over thee. Now, if you read other translations, you won't see the idea of 
your desire shall be contrary to your husband. You see, there's the viewpoint that is coming forth in relationship to this idea of gender. That the woman is contrary to her husband. Her desires are contrary to his. Not her desire shall be to her husband, but contrary to him. What does that do to the unity that is to be seen in the husband-wife relationship? If the woman is contrary to her husband and her desires are contrary to his, then how is that being one? That the two shall be one flesh. And all that that idea of oneness includes, can you imagine it being stated of Jesus that Jesus' desire was contrary to the Father's? Well, of course not. And yet, that same type of a relationship as far as Christ and the church in Ephesians 5th chapter is illustrated by the husband-wife relationship. Can the church be contrary to Christ? Well, of course not. And yet, if the desire of the wife shall be contrary to her husband, then it would be all right for the church to be contrary to Christ. And the unity that is seen in the Godhead would be a contrary unity Oh, wait, that doesn't even make sense, does it? If you have unity, you don't have that aspect of being contrary to one another. They are, John the 17th chapter, one. And Christ, in that prayer, prayed that we would all be one as he and the Father are one. Well, that means if the desire of would be contrary to her husband, that that oneness, since husband and wife, are, we find in chapter 2, are one, then it means that all believers are to be contrary to each other. You start seeing thus what they mean by this gender-inclusive language when they translate Genesis 3.16 in this way. But another illustration in Matthew the 12th chapter in verse 31. Therefore, I tell you, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven people, but the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. Instead of using the common term man they have to change it to get rid of that so that it can be more gender inclusive and use the term people will be forgiven people again that is just succumbing to the feminist movement in our society to try to remove the idea of man from everything one other passage, James 3 and verse 8, and these no doubt could be multiplied many times over because they tell us in the preface, this is what they're doing. <laughs> they want to remove these things and they want to be gender inclusive. So, Genesis, uh, James 3 and verse 8, but no human being can tame the tongue. It is a relentless evil full of deadly poison. Instead of no man, uh, that's a simple reading, no man can tame the tongue. They have to remove the idea of man because it's not gender inclusive according to what they say. Now, I think really if you go back into a study of languages, everyone recognizes, and I don't really even think there's a need to do so, that the term man was always could be used as a 
gender inclusive term in that it, it included both genders, man and woman. It could be used in relationship to just the man. And so, you know, who had difficulties with that? No one had difficulties until the feminists came along and tr started trying to attack men and the male species in regards to that. <clears throat> so that's a couple of things. Uh, um, in the actual te uh, preface, that shows us where they're going. That's why I said, if they had been faithful to what they said, it would have been one thing. But now let's look at some other passages. The first one we want to look at is Genesis 49 and verse 10, where they have, the scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, until tribute comes to him. They relegate, and if you look at the King James, and I probably should have put the King James beside it, uh, they relegate until Shiloh come to a footnote. If you look at the footnotes, and a lot of times footnotes are interesting as well. Uh, just as an aside, the New American Standard that uh, so many will use, even members of the church, uh, has some good points. But if you look at the footnotes, there are a lot of times that they put in the footnotes the literal rendering and tell you what the, the actual rendering is. And years ago, well, now then, a few decades ago, I was wondering, why didn't they put the literal rendering in the text? I didn't understand then. I don't understand why they didn't now. But on this one, they render until Shiloh come as a footnote. When Moses wrote this in Genesis 49, and we're dealing with really, uh, here's a time in which prophecies are being made. Jacob has called his sons together, and he's going to prophesy in relationship to each one of his sons. And when we come down to this verse in relationship to Judah, he's making a prophecy in relationship to Judah. And it is a direct prophecy dealing with the Messiah. It is not until tribute come, but it is until Shiloh come. Moses did not have in mind, nor did Jacob, the idea of tribute being paid to someone, nor did he have in mind the city of, Sh of Shiloh. There was a city called Shiloh in that time frame. It later became Jerusalem. But... Instead, he is dealing with the coming of a person. That person is our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. By removing this idea of until Shiloh come, he is they are removing that prophecy of our Lord. Notice even in the ESV how that states, the scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a ruler's staff. He is showing that here when Shiloh comes, that person, 
that that kingship is going to remain within that tribe of Judah through that time frame. David was of, for example, the tribe of Judah. Our Lord came from the tribe of Judah. That's why he could not be a priest upon this earth. Why? Because he's not of the tribe of Levi. It's obvious that he came from the tribe of Judah. What is it? Here is that ruling power, that ruling situation, is not going to depart from that tribe till he comes. They've taken that totally out. There is absolutely no way you can get to an understanding using their translation that this has reference to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and Him being King of kings and Lord of lords. They've taken it out. They've excluded it. While Levi was that priestly class, Judah was the kingly class or tribe. And that was going to take place. It continued until Christ comes. Not until some type of tribute is paid. Of course, they leave it up in the air. Who was tribute paid to? Who paid the tribute? There are a lot of, you know, it just... It is a statement that just lends itself to all types of speculation when there's no reason to. They put it in the footnote that this is what it should be. The literal rendering is until Shiloh come. Why not put it in the text? But instead of translation, they tried to put some type of interpretation on it instead. A next passage is Matthew 5 and verse 17. Where they have, do not think that I have come to abolish the law and the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. The ESV translators followed in the footsteps of the majority of translations, and I use that term loosely, that we find today on the market. They use the word abolish instead of the word destroy. Think not that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For one thing, this is a direct contradiction to what Paul writes in Ephesians 2 and verse 15, as translated in the ESV, by abolishing the law, the commandment expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself, in himself one new man in place of two, so making peace. Now which is it, ESV translators, and all of the others who use abolish in Matthew 5 and verse 17? Did he not come to abolish them, or did he come to abolish them, and that's what he accomplished? Now, Ephesians 2.15 says that's what he did. He accomplished the abolishing of the law. Yet you say that he's not coming for that reason. Now, which one is it? Did he accomplish something that he did not intend to accomplish? Well, we might have some difficulties in relationship to our thinking about Christ and God if we hold such a view. But yet, the majority of new translations use this terminology. What's the problem with it? Well, one thing, Jesus did abolish the law. He did not destroy the law. 
I use, and I think I've used this illustration before, but the Declaration of Independence, our nation is founded upon. If, and you can't do this, of course, but if you could get your hands on that document and you burn it up or you tear it to shreds or whatever, you have destroyed that document. But our nation is still founded upon that declaration. Even if you destroy the document, it's still in effect. It's still in force. Christ did not come to destroy the law and the prophets. He had the, and by the way, if you could get hold of the Declaration of Independence and do that, it would show basically a disrespect for that document. The idea of destroy by its very nature shows a disrespect for something. Whatever it is that you're destroying. Jesus held the utmost respect for the law and the prophets. Thus, he did not come to destroy them. He did, however, come to abolish them. To abolish something is to remove its force. It's no longer in effect. Uh, Several of our states here in the United States have gone through in their history different nations who had control of that state. Um, I've forgotten how many Florida had, uh, I think something like five or six different ones. When the one nation has its laws, and it is in control of a state. But another nation comes along and takes over that. They, the laws of that first state have been abolished. They're no longer in force. I am no longer subject to those laws because they're no longer in force. Have those laws been destroyed? No. Other nations might, or other states, other places might still be subject to those laws. They haven't been destroyed. But as far as where we live, or that location, they have been abolished from the standpoint they are no longer in force. We're no longer subject to them. Jesus did come to abolish the law and the prophets. In other words, he is taking them where they no longer have any force upon anyone. He did not destroy them. They still exist. We still learn from them. We learn a lot of things. They are set saying forth examples for us, our consideration that we learn from those examples. We learn about the nature of God. We learn about the nature of sin. We learn about the need for a Savior. We need to learn a lot of things in relationship to that Old Testament law. But it is no longer a law to which we are subject. Why? Because Christ abolished it. But he did not destroy it. He had the utmost respect for it. Thus the idea... I have come to fulfill them, to fulfill the law, and in fulfilling the law, it's no longer in force. It's no longer a law of which anyone is subject to. Now then, when these translations come and use the word abolish instead of the word destroy, or a synonym of destroy. There's probably other words that could have been used. But when they choose that word abolish, then they, one, have a direct contradiction with Ephesians 2 and verse 15. And they do the exact, 
they're saying that Jesus did not do what he actually came to do, and that is to abolish the law by fulfilling the law so that no one today is subject to the law of Moses, to the prophets. The principles that are found therein, we still are, because they are principles that come from God, we're subject to principles that come from God in the same way, but we're not subject to the details of the law. And that includes the Ten Commandments. You mean you don't believe in going by the Ten Commandments? No. By the way, it was never given to anyone but the Jews. Why should Gentile or Gentiles it was never given to? So we're not subject to it to begin with. Number two, Christ abolished that law. He took it out of the way. Now then, some people will say and use the term, wrongly so, that those laws were brought over into the New Testament. No, not really, but I understand their, their usage of the term. Those laws that were found in the Ten Commandments are set forth within the New Testament. Go back to the illustration. You have a nation that's over a state, whether it be Florida or another state, and they have that it is a law that you cannot murder someone. Another nation takes over that area. They have abolished that previous law. Does that mean that you can murder people now? No, the new state might, or nation might have that same law. You, shall, it's, uh, you cannot murder people. Oh, well. Did they carry it over from the previous law? No, it's their law. The same principle would hold true with here you have a law from God that was given to the Jews that included you shall not murder. You see a law from God in relationship to the New Testament law, the law of Christ, that yes, includes that and actually expands upon it. But we're not subject to the Old Testament nor the Ten Commandments, even as that person in this state is no longer subject to that previous law. Even though there might be elements in both laws that are the same. It might be, and I'm sure it is, in most state or most nations in the world today, illegal to murder someone. Does that mean I'm subject to those other nations? No. Did those other nations write their laws in the laws of the United States? No. But people recognize the fact that it's wrong to murder. And so they have that in there. This is a problem with new translations. They have followed in the same footsteps of all of these others and using this term abolish here. Christ did come to abolish the law and the prophets. This says he did not come to do it. But he did do, come to do that and he accomplished that pers uh, purpose as we see in Ephesians 2 and verse 15. That's a problem. <clears throat> but it's a problem with many translations. We're going to stop at this point and pick up, Lord willing, next Sunday afternoon with some other aspects and then go into some questions in relationship to translations. But Bible translation should, as the ESV claimed to do, have such a nature that it translates, actually translates, brings the words over into the English language so that I have now in my possession the Word of God and not their Word. When I have the Word of God, I can then study it, I can learn what God wants me to know, not what they want me to know, the translators. 
I know what God wants me to know. I know what he wants me to know in being saved and in remaining saved. Now, if you've not obeyed the gospel that God has set forth for us as to what we must do to be saved, then we would encourage you to do that this afternoon. Or if you have, but you haven't lived the way that God wants you to live and you need to repent of your sins and let us pray with you, we would encourage you to come as we stand and sing the invitation song.